Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burris. Joining us today is Ryan Young. He's a fellow at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, and he focuses on regulatory and monetary policy and financial regulation. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Income inequality has been something that's been with humanity for, let's just call it, quite a long time. Um, it's nothing new, but it does seem to be something new in the public consciousness. It, the, the specifics of income inequality and the 1% versus the 99% rhetoric seems to be the, the hot new topic. So before we get into, I guess, discussing what inequality is, how to think about it, and what, if anything, we should do about it, why do people seem so fixated on it now? One of the reasons might be aesthetics, the 1% versus the 99%. I, I would prefer people to get along with each other. So instead of saying the 1% versus the 99%, um, and when people talk about ratios instead of actual flesh and blood human beings, why not talk about people? instead of ratios. And that's, I, if anything, the inequality debate just simply needs to be reframed. Talk about people, not ratios. Have we seen inequality go up? It seems like at the very least the returns that the quote unquote 1% get on their investments such as Steve Jobs, he benefited greatly from a worldwide economy as opposed to millionaires and billionaires of of days past who may not have had people in China sell, to sell iPhones to. So have the rich gotten richer regardless of whether or not uh, the poor have gotten poorer? Um, the answer is yes, the rich have gotten richer. But the more important thing, again, people, not ratios, the poor have also gotten much richer. So Steve Jobs made his fortune and Bill Gates and all the others – made their fortunes by making other people better off. And almost all of those people were worse off than themselves. They might not have been billionaires or even millionaires. They still benefited from the iPhone or the PC um, and all these other products that they, that they use to make themselves better off. It's mutually beneficial. It's not a bad thing. So is that something this a lot of the anti-income inequality rhetoric and the we need to do something about this is it it seems like so is this true that it it depends at least in large part on thinking about the economy as zero sum? A lot of people do think that way. It's not actually the case in real life, but yes, a lot of people do think that way. Um I mean economists call it the zero sum fallacy and Rightfully so. Why, why is it a fallacy? The reason is that when people agree, can, when consenting adults agree to make a deal with each other, well, they consent. The only reason either one agrees to the deal is that because both parties think that they'll both be better off. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. Well, but doesn't that – I mean the – so the, the, the person – our friends on the left would say, of course, you know, like if I go and accept, say, a job that pays a minuscule amount, I, I had a choice and I thought in the moment that I accepted it that I'm better off than if I didn't accept it because I need that money to put food on the table. But my choice is happening within the context of a larger system, a larger economy, a larger social structure such that – I didn't necessarily have that much of a choice. Like you can still be – you as the employer or the, the capitalist classes could still be exploiting me via the, the structure of the system without holding a gun to my head and making me accept you know, the, the individual choices about accepting or rejecting employment or accepting or rejecting buying health insurance or whatever else. Cato just put out a series of videos which I would encourage our listeners to watch. And in the third one, towards the end, one of the lawyers asked an excellent question that speaks exactly to the point that you're making. And this is not verbatim, but 
how does preventing a young man from getting his first steady job prevent income inequality? If your goal is to level the level of incomes, how does that help anybody? Well, that then those videos, uh, which are part of the Libertarians.org project, uh, Freedom on Trial, Freedom on Trial. Uh, but in Aaron's question is more about the context of the choice. It's it it reminds me of the the quote who I believe is from some French person. Uh, we could put that in the show notes, but something along the lines of the law and its magisterial equality prohibits both the rich and the poor from sleeping under bridges. But the question of whether or not the poor have choices, that rich have more choices that the poor may not have. And so when they're taking a job that's $3 an hour or $4 an hour or 50 cents an hour, they there may only be jobs that are 50 cents an hour. So maybe we should do something to fix that and give them jobs that are $15 an hour. Then the question becomes, does the minimum wage or similar policies, do those actually do anything to fix that problem? I think the answer is no. Well, we'll get, we'll get to minimum wage uh, in in a bit. I think we were going to kind of walk through because there are two papers that you have co-authored uh, with Ian, with your colleague Ian Murray about income inequality. Uh, one of them, which you call people not ratios, discusses the difference, the, the fact that you think that the inequality debate is somewhat askew, which you've already alluded to, because it's focusing on relative ratios rather than absolute poverty. What? Why is it important to to make that distinction? Because I think um, everyone um, of every political persuasion is concerned about helping the worst off. Everyone has the same goal. The question is, how do you go about it? And I think a lot of folks are so focused on inequality, they see a difference between a rich man's income and a poor man's income, that that's all they care about. They don't even care about how was the poor man doing? How can you help them out? How can you make people's incomes rise over time? Those are questions that, to a large extent, are not being asked. And I think that is a major flaw in the debate, and I think we need to reframe the debate um, to ask, how are people doing, as opposed to what is the ratio between a CEO's and a median worker's income? In that in that paper, you also discuss uh, the writings of of someone who recently brought income inequality to the the discussion, uh, Thomas Piketty, a French economist. Uh, what did Piketty say about income inequality, and what what's wrong with what he said? Well, that is a very rich topic. I'll try to keep it brief. Oh no, uh, we we can go on. You can go in depth if you want. That's what we do in these parts. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we in this side of a uh, of Cato, we go in depth. So if you if you want to. Uh, really hash it out. Go for it. Okay. I'll, I'll, again, I'll try to keep it brief, but also noted. Um, Piketty's general story is that in the bad old days, back when monarchy was the dominant form of government, you had very high inequality, which means essentially that the nobility held almost all of the wealth and everyone else had nearly nothing. They lived at subsistence level. Um, after the world wars in the 20th century, death and destruction made things more equal. Fortunes were brought down, even though very few people were actually made better off. In the post-war years, inequality has grown again, and it continues to grow today. And actually, Piketty argues that as of about 2010 or so, Income inequality is roughly where it was right before World War I. So uh, they call that a U-shaped curve because uh, the dominant measure used for income inequality is called the Gini coefficient. It ranges from zero to one. In the Belle Epoque Europe, um, before, say, the French Revolution or so, it was very close to one, about 0.85 which meant that the nobles had everything and everyone else had nearly nothing. That's not fair. And then the revolution happened and then, of course, the 19th century wealth explosion happened. You had the world wars and the flattening, which 
uh, describes the U-shape that Piketty describes. And then lately, yeah, since about the 1950s or 1960s, you've seen growing income inequality. Now, the trouble is, is the question that we want to answer, is it inequality or is it how do we make human beings better off? I think the debate is being framed in precisely the wrong way. And that's because people are focused on inequality instead of people. Does so one of the counters to that would be to say, of course, the poor today, say the poor in the United States, um, even if their relative position compared to the wealthy is the same as it was in the early 20th century or the 1500s or you know like however bad we might want to believe it is um, that of course their lives are quite a lot better than the peasants were or poor people living in industrial revolution England but the amount of money that you have the amount of stuff that you can buy is not the only thing that matters for the quality of your life that you know we should care about when we care about people and that the that at some level basic inequality which isn't just monetary but often then transfers into power and dignity and respect within a society um, that that sort of inequality does degrade a person's quality of life, that it is harmful to see that there are other people who have so much more than you do. And so, yes, we don't want to impoverish everybody to flatten the income distribution, but caring about people means caring about them in a holistic sense and not just how much money they can bring in. That is probably the best and the hardest question you could ask about the inequality debate at all because it really ties into how do people feel about it? How do they talk about inequality? Everyone wants to keep up with the Joneses. Uh, if your neighbor gets a new car, maybe you want one for yourself. And that kind of sentiment is, well, it's part of what makes us human. That's, that's both a good thing and a bad thing. It incentivizes us to create wealth and to do business with others and create mutual benefits. At the same time, if the fellow next door has something more than you, well, you get a little bit jealous and that often is the case uh, for – that people make for bad public policies. Are we being too dismissive though in that sense because if we're focusing on the well-being of people, um, are we being too dismissive of inequality? You 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 brought up the Gini coefficient of, of the Ancien Regime in, in France for example as 0.85 and how that was bad. But why was that Gini coefficient bad? Uh, what sorts of inequality are bad in the way that we should care about them morally and, and use policies to try and fix it? The reason isn't so much the measure of the Gini coefficient. Um, like you said, it was 0.85 in uh, pre-revolutionary France. In most of the U.S., the measure is somewhere around 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Um, it varies from state to state. The measure that I think we need to talk about is how people are doing. And that's what we need to do by having a conversation like we're doing today, but also like everyday people need to have with each other. As in, how are you doing? Are you doing better off than your parents? Are you better off than your grandparents? Are your children going to be better off than you? And the answer to all of those questions for most people is yes. So how do we continue that trajectory? How do we make more people better off? I think people are making – are asking the wrong questions and I think we need to reframe the debate. I'm curious as, as we're talking about this, I'm wondering if – so that obviously if we're having the debate the wrong way and we're paying, putting too much attention on these relative versus absolute measures, it can lead us to bad policies which can hurt people. So the, the minimum wage being an example of a policy that can be well-meaning but can do a lot of harm. Um, but at the same time, it seems like framing the debate the wrong way could also be hurting people 
merely by convincing them that they're being hurt. So if we're constantly saying, look at these people who are screwing you over and you're you know, they're only rich because you're poor and they're, you know, they're getting poor, they're getting rich off of your back. Um, you're going to inculcate resentment. Um, you're going to convince people that they're worse off than they really are, and you're going to convince people to judge the quality of their lives by measures that I think we agree are not as important. So whether Bill Gates has more money than I am is not the best way to measure how well my life is going either from an economist standpoint or just subjectively from my standpoint. But if someone's telling me that, you know, this guy is the problem, then I'm going to start seeing I'm going to start seeing my life is worse than it really is. That's that's a common problem. I think the question that all of us are asking is how can we make folks lives better? Mm -hmm. And I think one of the biggest answers to that question is actually occupational licensing. Um, for example, roughly one third of people need the government's permission to get up and go to work in the morning. I don't think that's right. I mean, I, if I needed brain surgery or something like that, I would not want to go to an uncertified surgeon. Point well taken. But at the same time, if you want to arrange flowers or decorate a room, or you name it, a lot of times folks need to get the government's permission, they need to get a license, and a lot of times the folks who grant the license are the incumbents in business who have a vested interest in keeping out competitors and limiting the competition. And well, if you look at why workforce participation is at a near 50-year low, that's a big reason why. And I think that does a lot to widen not just the ratio of income inequality, but it also does a lot to keep poor people down. The, a lot of people might hear – I've heard, probably heard about – if they listen to Free Thoughts, they've heard us talk about occupational licensing. and But identifying it as one of the causes of income inequality might seem like a stretch. Uh, it, it, it's a bad thing. Um, it's not. It's. It's. We have too many licensed industries, but I mean, really, is it is it that big of drain on poor people's ability to move ahead in life, or is it just sort of a marginal contribution? I think it's rather more than a marginal contribution. If you have an idea and you have a decent work ethic, you should be able to start your own business. That's it. There's not much more to it than that. <laughs> why? Why are folks getting in your way? Yeah, the but it seems also, especially for poorer people, if you look at, uh, I mean, we're talking about thousands of hours for some of these professions, correct? And a lot of these people don't have thousands of hours to get the to get license. to the, the license. Yeah, in in addition to however much money it costs, and so that that's pretty daunting to someone making yeah, in a fact, barista uh, who wants to become a hairdresser, for example. That's that's a good question. Um, in fact, in one of my papers that you guys mentioned, um, there's a African hair braider, Benta Dio. She emigrated to the Seattle area and started. I mean, she became an American and she became an entrepreneur. That's wonderful. And when she started her own hair braiding business, uh, turns out that she needed roughly. 1,600 hours of cosmetology licensing. And when you look at the content of what the courses and the classes took, um, she does not do hair braiding, or sorry, she doesn't do hair dyeing, she doesn't do styling, she doesn't do anything else. She All she does is braiding. So not only would she have to spend roughly three quarters of a working year, that's nine months of full-time work that she could not be able to spend actually making money and providing for her family, that she would have to spend on things that are worse than useless because those are services that she does not provide. And again, the people granting the licenses are her direct competitors. So you can see why that is, uh, shall we say, unfair. It's stacking the deck against poor people. 
yeah, ask anyone to take nine months off to get prepared for something uh, of, of not working and trying to get a better job. And that's usually supposed to be something like school, but uh, but as you said, the requirements didn't even relate. But only rich people would really be able to afford or be able to take nine months off uh, to prepare themselves for a new career. That's right. It's it's stacking the deck. That's what occupational licensing is. Um, so when people on the it typically is the very far left, like your um, the the same people who protest in Seattle against WTO meetings and, and those sorts of folks. When You're they, showing your age, people <laughs> people don't remember that. As they, was they that ninety nine? Do I mean, no, was that, that ninety nine? The big protest. Uh, pretty old. That um, was a pretty long. So time whatever, ago. whatever. That was those, the year the Matrix came out, Aaron, and X Men One. So that's how old it is. College age kids who <laughs> all have dogs and live together in houses um, that they mm. rent, like. Um, the hippie sorts, but when they protest, um, those kinds of people, when they are protesting, I'll use the the now horribly cliched libertarian go to example for basically everything, which is Uber. Um, and when they're protesting Uber, which and typically their their protests or at least the you know the issue that they're objecting to is that Uber is operating without some sort of license or regulatory permission or something else that the taxi companies operate under. They their their objection is that this will hurt working class people to allow it because it's not it's not just that there's a cost associated with the licensing but the licensing if you if you allow someone to come in without the license then that person's going to be cheaper or they're going to flood the market with labor or products and that in turn is going to hurt the established people which we tend to portray as you know these Politically connected corporations, um, but are often, you know, say, relatively low income taxi drivers who have, you know, came to this country and have been driving for thirty years and are now going to be put out of work by this upstart um, Uber that's not following the laws. And so, is there, you know, the occupational licensing getting rid of it would also come with costs. And in a lot of cases, these licensing schemes are in place in relatively low income professions like hair braiders. Um, and so, should we be concerned about the people who would be harmed by getting rid of licensing of various sorts? Well, that hardly sounds like a horrible fate for consumers, which again are the ultimate point of production. People don't live to produce, they live to consume. But uh, almost every Uber driver I've talked to has said, and a lot of them have also and still do work as taxi drivers with the licenses and the medallions and the other occupational license requirements that every city has, they prefer the Uber and the Lyft model. And I think that's not just good for consumers, it's good for the drivers. They can set their own hours. They don't have to answer to awful bosses or uh, corrupt bureaucrats. They can do what they want. And I think that is something that everybody likes or nearly everybody likes. Let's go back to the minimum wage, which we brought up earlier in the episode. Uh, get sort of into the nitty gritty of it. It's a very popular topic. It's brought up consistently by particularly the left, uh, saying that we need to raise the minimum wage. Um, Hillary has said it many times. Bernie Sanders had said it. It's sort of part of the catechism of the left. You kind of have to believe it in order to be a liberal in America, modern America. That's why it was a mini scandal when her leaked email showed that. She or at least her senior people were not fans of raising the minimum wage. Well, they thought fifteen dollars was too high. I think yeah. they thought ten dollars or so. So this might show that it's it's merely rhetoric that they might understand that uh, we can't s solve this quote unquote problem with, by just mandating that people get paid more. Uh, but people seem to think so. But so why is the minimum wage uh, so attractive to people? And what's wrong with thinking that we can solve problems with it? I think it's because a lot of people think that it's a free lunch. You look at a, a proposed minimum wage increase, the federal rate is currently 725. There are lots of proposals to put it to 1010. Um, there's the fight for 15. Um, just you name the level and someone's proposed it. Usually about two thirds of people will support it. It's very, very popular. And like I said, the reasons that people think it's a free lunch. So um, what I've been doing, along with trying to reframe the inequality debate, 
is also trying to reframe the minimum wage debate. There are trade-offs. I'm actually agnostic on whether or not to raise the minimum wage or whether to do away with it altogether. I just want people to acknowledge that it has trade-offs. For example, a lot of your jobs um, will have on-the-job perks. Maybe you get a free lunch if you work at a restaurant. Maybe you'll get free parking if you work at a shopping mall um, where other people have to pay. And on and on and on down the line, annual bonuses, you name it. When you raise the minimum wage, especially at, at a place that has a lower prevailing wage, some of those on-the-job perks are going to go away because they're trade-offs. The minimum wage increase is not free. It comes at a cost. And another point that I think a lot of people should uh, – I think they would do well to understand is that, well, suppose those free perks under the table stuff, well, they're not taxed. Wages are taxed. So it's a de facto tax increase on poor people. I don't think that's fair. Does the minimum wage just redistribute money from within a business though? That seems to be maybe the acknowledged point of it that – the CEO or the profit, the person who's holding the profits of a McDonald's is going home with $180,000 a year and they're paying their employees seven twenty-five an hour. So we're going to have them pay them ten twenty-five dollars an hour and then the person at the CEO is going to go home with $160,000 a year and that's a good thing. We've lowered inequality. We've made people better off. And what's $20,000 to the person making that much compared to the, the wage increase that the lower wage workers would get? It's a good thing for the lower wage workers who do in fact find jobs and get hired. It's a bad thing for the workers who never get hired in the first place, who can't find their jobs, who never get work experience, who don't learn basic skills such as showing up on time or whether it's specialized trade skills that you learn in whatever your first job is. Um, it's. It's not fair to the poor. Minimum wages are – the trade-offs are severe. Can we measure that sort of stuff? I mean obviously we can measure like within given businesses, you know, a city or a state enacts an increase in the minimum wage and we can see whether businesses let workers go um, and we can track overall unemployment and overall unemployment among low-skilled or low-education workers. But these longer-term trends about – you know, they're not getting the experience that they would have otherwise gotten at entry level jobs, and then that hurts them long term. Um, is there a way that we can we can demonstrate whether that's actually happening empirically versus saying, you know, as free marketers, well, these are the things we expect to have happen? Yes, there is, but not with much precision, which is unfortunate, but that's the way it goes. Um, the predominant pro minimum wage study. Uh, is by David Card and uh, I forget the other fellow's name, but they looked at fast food restaurants in New Jersey and found that rather than raising prices or cutting jobs, they simply cut into their margins, made the workers work harder instead of cutting wages, which kind of is the same thing as a pay cut, but they don't go into that. Um, but roughly 79% of PhD economists believe that the minimum wage has a trade-off which involves throwing people out of work. Um, again, it's up to you to decide whether that's a good thing or not, but it has trade-offs. And um, to quantify them, I think roughly 3% of workers currently make minimum wage. But the opportunity costs um, that I've been talking about, the workers who never get hired, the workers who never gain experience, you cannot quantify that. Now, it's interesting you mentioned that only about 3 percent of workers make minimum wage, which itself I don't think anyone really – I mean no one disputes this basic fact. Uh, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders don't dispute this fact. Uh, with that very small section of the American worker – it seems like a weird thing to have as as much you know as much discussion as we have on it. 
uh, as a way of sort of fixing the world when it's only going to, if it does anything, affect 3% of workers. Uh, but and so we can move on to. There's some other things you discuss. I mean, minimum wage gets a lot of attention, but other things that could be fixed to help people get ahead. More people, maybe than just the three percent who make minimum wage. Um, you write, for example, that affordable energy uh, can help the poor. How is energy being made unaffordable, and and how would that help the poor? Usually through regulation, and and that's the trouble. How many folks want to regulate energy production? Well, they're going to. That's why we have an EPA and an energy department. And I'm not a fan of either. But <laughs> Do we have we could we quantify how much like how much energy might co- how much money they add these regulations add to the price of energy? Well, let's take one step back and then a step forward. The step back is um, thinking about people who live in absolute poverty. You're talking about people who live in mud huts and who have to burn dung indoors for their heat and for their cooking. This is not a healthy way to live. It reduces life expectancy. In fact, this kind of energy poverty kills people. So when you can transition to fossil fuels or this or that kind of clean energy, I mean, who knows what the future will bring? I'm eager to see it myself. It's rather better than the mud hut option. Um, So I would love to see more people be able to embrace that, which brings us, well, another step back to our people's, not ratios, uh, concept when it comes to inequality. Make people better off. Don't worry so much about the ratio between the rich and the poor. The other one that often is discussed is, is, and this is sort of almost as much of a "Quote unquote cliche on the right, as a, as the minimum wage is on the left, and that is regulations. Uh, when the right says regulations, they usually say it with some sort of foreboding: too many regulations, so much regulation. Uh, I think a lot of people don't really understand what that means. Uh, that just means there's rules on things. Uh, how big a problem is regulatory impact on the economy, and in particular the poor, the well-being of the poor? It's a very big problem. Anyone who follows politics knows that the federal government spends, I don't know, three and a half trillion dollars and change. The budget deficit, a little less than half a trillion. National debt, about 18 trillion at this point. Nobody knows what the numbers are for regulation. And I think that is a huge hole in the news coverage that's going on right now, whether it's the presidential campaign or or anything else, very few people know that the total burden of just federal regulations are about $1.9 trillion per year. State and local rules are extra. So even if you're just talking about the federal government, a lot of folks on the left and the right do like to complain about the size of government. Most of them don't know that it's half again as big as they think it is. Um, If you actually go through uh, the code of federal regulations, which is where they store all these things, and by the way, if you want, you can order one from the government printing office. They will email you, or sorry, they will mail you 237 volumes, which total roughly 178,000 pages. I assume are these are uh, big print pages for, for people who need, need eyeglasses. So uh, when you're typing up a manuscript for a book, usually you consider 250 words to be a page. The average Federal Register page is roughly 1,000 words in small font, multi-column type. And so you Tol- get Tolstoy eat your heart out kind of thing. This is, this is a lot of words and a lot of pages. Yeah. And – And every day you get about 300 pages more of them. In fact, this year's Federal Register, which is where new regulations get published, among other things, it's on pace to be almost 90,000 pages, and that's just for this year. Now, people, again, might might think, okay, a lot of people don't encounter these regulations directly in their lives. They don't run a business or they don't don't, uh, try and buy and sell land or other ways that you might get – interact with the regulations. So they might be wondering, okay, so there's a bunch of pages, uh, but 
what's an example? How does one of these regulations? I mean, you can just pick one if you want. Uh, what cost poor people uh, jobs and opportunity? Well, for example, this year, um, I'm actually looking up the exact number right now. Upwards of 500 regulations affect small businesses. And again, I'll, I, if you really care, I can get you the exact number, but uh, the number's in that ballpark. And just if you want to start a business, you want to create jobs, you want to create value for other people, it gets harder and harder every year. I'm, there are regulations for everything from, say, the size of holes in Swiss cheese to preventing collisions at sea. I mean, you name it. It sounds like a good thing, though, preventing collisions at sea. I'm just trying to figure out how, how someone is losing a job or money because of this. A lot of it's opportunity costs. And a lot of that is what makes uh, free market folks, uh, it makes it difficult to make the case because a lot of what we have to say is about opportunity costs. I mean, if you really want to, I would encourage you to try to stand at a podium in front of a factory that was never built, that builds a product that was never invented, in front of workers who were never hired. It's less concrete. The uh, the other things you discuss. There's a few other things you discuss in the in the paper. Um, which are the second one about uh, about possibilities for reform? Um, you discussed a little bit about central banks. Um, what what can central or central banks helping the inequality problem? Or I guess more specifically, are they hurting the poor? There's not a lot that they can do to actively help. What they can do is prevent harm. So if you're a central banker, what you want to do is have an honest price system. You don't want to have radical inflation. You don't want to have radical deflation. What you want is a stable, honest currency that people can rely on. So um, all of us know that, for example, say the price of computers goes down year after year. If you want a certain amount of computing power, it's going to get cheaper. Moore's Law and all that. A lot of other commodities uh, also go down in price over time. That's fine. What you don't want is monetary inflation or deflation. What you want is a stable amount of money chasing a stable amount of wealth. Or well, actually you want growing wealth, so I misspoke. But you want the amount of dollars to approximately match the amount of wealth. So there are a lot of ways to do that, and the way to do that is to bind the central bank to a set rule, and there are a lot of good candidates out there, I don't really care myself which one they choose, so long as they do, in fact, bind themselves to a rule instead of the completely ad hoc policy that the Fed has been following, um, not just under Chairman Yellen, but also in, under Ben Bernanke and also under uh, Mr. Greenspan for about the second half of his tenure. The point isn't so much what the rule is, it's that a central bank needs to follow a rule. And that way we can have honest prices, which every entrepreneur and every investor who wants to think about the long term, not just about themselves, but about their children and their grandchildren, they need that. And at least the Fed is not giving that to them right now. One of the other policies that at least in the minds of a lot of voters, they think will help the working class get more of a leg up but that you argue hurts the poor is collective bargaining. Um, how, does, how does collective bargaining make people on the bottom worse off? The arguments uh, to that are actually pretty similar to the minimum wage. Uh, the crux of it is trade-offs. So some workers – actually do benefit. Um, that is not in dispute. The trouble is that other people are hurt. And that's what I care about. Um, for example, some workers might uh, get a higher wage, better benefits, but other workers are, again, opportunity costs. You can't quantify those things, but some workers never get hired. 
some workers, maybe they have to settle for lower paying jobs. Those people are hurt. What about them? What does the state of unionization look like in the country? Or have we seen a drop off in how many people are, are unionized uh, that maybe parallels some of the the lowering status of the poor? Uh, unionization has dropped off quite a bit in the private sector. It's now below 7%. In the public sector, because remember, governments can't move away. They can't escape from anybody. They're captive. They're closer to uh, somewhere between a quarter and a third of all of their work is being unionized. That's state, local, and federal, although the level is lower at the federal level. So, is that an important? Is there a difference between? I mean, you mentioned the government you can't move away. Um, why is there a reason you might sort of think that private sector unionization has gone down? I mean, some people might say it's because of, uh, say, NAFTA and foreign competition from trade, and so we've kind of destroyed our audio, auto manufacturing, and our unions can't keep up because they're competing against people in other in other countries. Uh, but why why is there that disparity, and is there something worse about public sector unions versus private unions? Well, seeing as since the passage of NAFTA in 1994, um, net employment has gone up by 21 million people. I think the job destruction argument falls flat. The reason for declining percentage of uh, private sector unionized workers, I think, has to do with escapability. If workers and companies can get away from it, they will. And that's why I think we have increased public sector unionization. They can't get away. And if we reformed this, or I mean, would you be in favor of prohibiting unionization or I mean, is it, would the, you would say this would have the same kind of effect as minimum wage, uh, r abolishing or getting rid of lowering minimum wage? Uh, would this, this ultimately would help the poor because some wages would go down, but the amount of people who get jobs would offset it. Is that the theory? I don't think unionization helps the poor. Um, that said, I am neutral on the issue. Um, I think I take the Mansur Olson line, the old University of Maryland economist, and a, who I think was a friend of Cato um, back mm -hmm. when he was alive. He said that unions couldn't really exist without some form of government coercion on their behalf. So if unions can survive on their own, I'm all for it. Workers should be able to bargain collectively if they want to. There should not be laws hindering that, nor should there be laws specifically favoring that either. It should be neutral, not opposed, not for, neutral. So we as advocates of free markets have – I mean you said it's important to have these discussions and we have these discussions a lot. Um, and watch these discussions happen around us in a much more one-sided way. Um, but what can we as libertarians, as fans of capitalism and markets, how can we get better at talking about these issues? What are there ways that we have approached them or rhetorically um, in the past or they're pretty common that you think are less helpful, ways that might be more fruitful, ways that might change hearts and minds more effectively? I think the best way is to tell stories about people, put names and faces and stories together. Um, my background's in economics and I, I can talk to you all day about this or that statistic or, <laughs> or this graph or that. Um, but really, if you're talking to folks, the best way to do it is to tell stories. It's it's hard to do um, and I think the main reason why is because of the opportunity costs that I've been talking about. You know, the factory that was never built, workers never hired that we talked about earlier. It's hard to do. It's hard to find those people who, who have been left. So would you think that that is one of the inherent problems with trying to win this debate is that they can point to someone who had a raise but it's hard to find the person who – didn't get a job. I think that's precisely it. Um, and I think one of the few examples that I've seen actually happened in, uh, well, you guys know how Seattle recently raised their minimum wage to $15 an hour. Um, before the city of Seattle did that, 
the city of SeaTac, which has the Seattle Tacoma Airport and a small population, but a large workforce, did that. Fifteen dollars an hour, and yeah, and there were trade-offs. People got fired. Um, people lost their free parking. No more free meals. People stopped tipping them. And those kinds of stories need to be told, and very few people are telling them. I think that is one of our biggest failures as a free market movement. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.